Save to see extensions, they are alive and well, so you're going to deal with it. Who am I? I'm Sam Rollins. There's my Twitter, there's my email. GitHub is on GTF White, GitHub Swallows. Um, my claims to fame in the Ruby community are none really thus far. Also, otherwise, claims to fame, none. So, quickly, what's the C extension? Um, okay, so MRI is the first C extension we know. We, we all know this. It's written in C. I'm sorry. It's the first implementation of Ruby, not C extension. It's written in C. So, many of the lower level libraries are written in C. These include fixed num, big num, string, hash, etc. You might be saying, okay, fixed num is older than my grandpa. Like, why do I care about these old ass uh, C extensions? So, even newer code in MRI, like 192, includes C extensions. So, array is largely a C extension, so they added keep if. Um, Dir.home is a C extension. The fiber class is a C extension. So, Ruby must be able to talk to the expansive world of C libraries, the vast array of C libraries out there, in order to be taken seriously. <coughs> so, they provide a C extensions API. It's basically the Ruby.h file. There's no formal extensions API. I think Matt wrote a little um, deoxygen document once. And then there's the pickaxe. So that's kind of all the API is. So some of your favorite gems are C extensions. These include most of the traditional SQL gems, not the newer NoSQL stuff. Those usually communicate um, via, via network um, sockets. Nokagiri, JSON, FastThread, etc. So I did a quick um, look at rubygems.org. So this is as of like, a couple days ago. They had about 21,000 gems. Only 413 are extensions, and I'm very okay with that because, of course, in Ruby, not everything should be an extension. So there's a few there. But amongst the top 100 downloaded, 18 are C extensions. I think that's a pretty, pretty high percentage. I, I was surprised by that. So the top 10 most downloaded C extensions, you can see, I'm sure some of your favorites are on here, JSON. Your opinion is on there, that's kind of neat. Um, so, motivations for writing a C extension. There are two, two motivations. 95%, I think more than 95% of C extensions are motivated by the following two reasons. One is speed. So, C code compiles down typically to faster machine code than, uh, than, than Ruby language, than Ruby code compiles down to in the, in the Ruby bytecode. And two is as a, bridge to, as, as, a, as a bridge to an existing C library. So, and then many C extensions are a mix of both of these. So two good examples are Zlib, and I mentioned Nokagiri. So Zlib is this old, old C library. It's called lib, Zlib, I think. And it is vetted. It has, it, you know, bugs have been opened and closed against it <coughs> excuse me, for years. So this is a very vetted old library. And it is very efficient. Over the years, it's become very, very, very efficient at encoding and decoding to compress. So the Zlib uh, C extension in Ruby takes advantage of that library for both speed and the existing code. So I am not the C extension Nazi. Coming up here and giving this talk, a lot of people might think that I am. I am not. I am a Rubyist. I need to take a side note now for all the anti monolingual Nazis that, and a lot of people actually. So how do I define, how do I define Rubyist when I say that I'm a Rubyist? I say that as a Rubyist, I try to program in Ruby more than 50% of the time. I program in so many other things. You have to as a Rubyist. This um, presentation, I just, it's mostly JavaScript that's running all this. Um, so I am a Rubyist. It is actually because I am a Rubyist that I, I can support C extensions because they support, they expose Ruby to a greater ecosystem uh, in the computing world. I try to be pragmatic. So let's look at pragmatic, kind of what, is, what are pragmatic C extensions. Here's a great example that I found and I've used this before. Chunky PNG is a pure Ruby library that does encoding and decoding of PNG files and you can, and it has some other features, cropping and changing colors. The same author wrote a C extension called Boiling PNG that is a C extension mix in. So it simply monkey patches some of the pure Ruby methods in encoding and decoding so that you have, it, your project kind of maybe gets some, gets some attention and has some fair usage and you need faster. You can use Euler PNG, you don't have to change any of your code, and now you have a much faster library. So they have some uh, benchmarks. We're going to kind of zoom in here on just these two. So this is for decoding, I believe. Chunky PNG using page filtering takes seven and a half seconds on this particular benchmark. Euler PNG is less than one tenth of a second. So that's more than eight times fast. That's pretty excellent. Our second example is JSON. 
So JSON comes in two variants. You can either gem install JSON, which is the C extension variant, or you can install gem install JSON pure. Gem, or JSON pure is a pure Ruby variant of the JSON library. If you need the speed though, you can instead require JSON if you have the right environment. So, um, and then another interesting thing is, is I think with either library, if you require JSON, it first checks to see that this, if the C extension is available and it's working. If not, it'll fall back to the pure Ruby code. So it's very, very pragmatic like that. So where's the love for C extensions? We're gonna look at a lot of recent criticisms um, of C extensions in recent years. So one is, this is kind of a big one, is that Ruby code is portable. And by portable, we're gonna read that as across platforms and across interpreters with VMs. Um, some, other, some other criticisms um, include how difficult it is to patch, monkey patch, or debug a C extension. And then self documented code does not exist if you're writing a C extension. A Rubyist should not have to read your not documented C code in order to figure out what it does. So let's look at patching. Complete these colors to do. So let's look at patching. If you're patching code, you kind of look at it and you want to add a patch, and you look and you see it's a C extension. Well, presumably it's a C extension for a reason. So you're going to have to patch the C extension with C code, and that's kind of how it's going to have to go if, you're, if, you, if you want to patch something that you think is broken in what appears to be a C extension. For monkey patching, this one I can relate to, I sympathize with. Tweaking a method's functionality is difficult if you just want to monkey patch um, something. So let's say I have an example here. Uh, I believe it was it's string. So if I wanted to monkey patch string, Capitalizer, actually, a better one was um, string star. Here we go. So they give you some neato documentation. Um, that's too big. Okay, so if I say ho times three, it's going gonna, it's gonna to repeat the string three times. But maybe I kind of want to monkey patch it up and I add an optional parameter that's a delimiter. So, you know, I'll add that exclamation space in myself so that I can just, just do it between the iterations. Well, let me look, it's probably easy to, to patch. Ah, crap, it's a C extension. This looks awful, and I, you know, now you're like in a much bigger mess. If you wanted to actually monkey patch this and keep it a C extension, you're going to have to write a C extension, create your, um, create all, everything that goes around a C extension, and compile it. So this is a big pain, and I sympathize with, um, with that. Debugging. Um, a Rubyist now needs to debug C if you're writing a C extension. And this, I think, feels crappy. And a Rubyist shouldn't have to know C in order to, in order to debug the code. It is possible to debug C extensions, but this kind of feels like a pain, and I think a lot of people just kind of throw up their hands at that point. Uh, another common concern is documentation. So, so code is not self-documenting. Um, they should not be expected, uh, any Rubyist should not be expected to know C. So they should not be expected to be able to read C in order to discover what a method does. So for this one, I'm using range uh, 2s. The document is way at the bottom here. So the documentation for this guy is it converts the range object to a printable form. What on earth does that mean? You know, I, I don't, does it like print out every element of the range? I don't, I don't know. So we'll make the documentation. We'll call this. It's a C extension. And this will take you, if you know C, this will take you a couple seconds. But they do some goofy. They're going to take this string that's dot, 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 and maybe they'll include all three dots, maybe just two. So it, what it does is it tells you, you know, if you do one dot, dot, two, two S, it will print out one dot, dot, two. But you wouldn't know that if you didn't know C. So the common solution, there is a solution to this, is documenting your code in your methods and including RDoc style comments, um, which RDoc is supported forever. I mean, that's kind of the whole reason why on, on that site we have our documentation. And Yarp now respects uh, our doc style comments and C extensions as well. So that's up on, on Yarp info. Um, so string capitalizes is an example of good, of good documentation now. Here's some literature examples of, of C extensions not getting a lot of love. Rubinius, their motto is use Ruby. So, which I really like. They have this whole quote on their page. You don't get to read it though, because you get to hear me talk. Basically, they're talking about how a lot of big languages like C and Ruby 
have this benefit that they're written in the language itself. So you get to kind of poke around the code that the language is written in, and that's a great feature because you kind of need to know one language in order to write in that one language. So if Ruby were like this, then you know these the, these other languages, people have these different benefits. So they include add, adding features to the language, fixing bugs, and learning how the language works. And these kind of map to those other points. So adding features to the language would be patching or monkey patching. Fixing bugs would be patching and debugging. And learning how the language works is kind of documentation. Uh, the next one is the 10th edition of the pickaxe. If anybody who says read the forward in their page three, you see that they no longer include the extension API. And they write that um, it's less relevant than it was, partially because all the extensions we need have been written for us. And this I probably uh, disagree with. And I, I actually don't really, I don't want to rag on them because that book was getting huge. And I think that their bigger goal was actually just to cut a lot of content. They cut a couple uh, appendices. But, um, but I'm going to show how C extensions are still readily being developed. I think that all of these are valid concerns, which is why most Ruby code is not written as a C extension in Ruby. However, there are times, such as the C extensions that we use every day, where the, where the speed or existing C code benefits <coughs> outweigh those concerns. So let's look at some recent uh, C extensions. I looked through Ruby 5. You guys use Ruby 5 to kind of keep a pulse on the Ruby community. I looked at just the last six months and kind of tried to find, you know, they cover, they cover updated libraries and new libraries. And I poked through, they don't explicitly mention C extensions, but I looked through and sure enough, they did cover C extensions. So they covered TinyTDS, which is a free TDS library um, for Ruby, which uses DB library. If you don't know what any of that means, it's largely a MS SQL client. That's what the DB library is, is an MS SQL client. Uh, summarize is C bindings for the Open Text Summarizer, which I think is Live Summarize, um, another C library. RGO is one of these geographic libraries that I don't know very well. Uh, Coolio, this one's very cool, it's a Node.js style of invented driven awesomeness, is what they call it. It's basically C bindings for LibEV. I think you can trust that it's very similar to Node.js. Node.js is largely wrappings for Ruby. Next is Streamlink, a streaming REST client for Ruby. It's a wrapper around the curl. Uh, IO Splice, this exposes Linux's zero copy function, Splice, which will do zero copies between, uh, it kind of creates a pipe between two handles. I think that's very exciting. I think that Splice could be uh, an example of where people can do pragmatic C extensions in the future, where in your production code that's running on Linux, you can just drop in something that's going to use Splice and speed up your app. I'm kind of excited about that. Handler Socket is a, a MySQL client. They call it the NoSQL MySQL. So there are two cleverly named, cleverly named Ruby extensions out there already. Ruby Handler Socket and Handler Socket. Uh, Gosu, this one has actually been around for a while. It's a C++ library um, with Ruby bindings already. Um, it's a gaming library. So there's a C++ extension for it. You can also mix in a Ruby bindings for this physics engine called Chipmunk. You can also mix in the Ruby, Ruby GL, which is a C extension to add 3D tier 2D games. There's some awesome examples of games made with those about that. There's a really good Super Mario Brothers as well. Uh, okay, and then just today, I had this like 10 minutes ago, mentions in Preston's talk earlier about Ruby supercomputing and GPU. There's a lot of C code in there, and I'm kind of excited about the last big concern is are C extensions portable? This is kind of where the state of C extensions comes in because this has changed recently. The answer is yes. A little asterisk there. But really just think of it as a yes. C extensions are portable. <laughs> so you're asking what's the asterisk all about? I need to ask one back. What does portability mean? So we need to define portability. We're going to define these two ways that we did before. Portability across platforms and portability across Ruby VMs and interpreters. And platforms is there in quotes because I think that's a not so well defined term, but I'm talking about operating systems and in some cases CPU architectures, like 32 or 64 bit. So, are they, across, are they portable across OSs? Well, where does Ruby code portal? I want to look at this. This is a weird answer. So, in Ruby 192's news file, basically the release notes for 192, they list these supported operating systems. This is the one. It's like, if you can kind of interpret that, I think it's 32-bit Debian Linux, but it definitely includes this weird UTF-8 characters in there. It's that one operating system. Then they list a uh, efforts made for, which is, <laughs> and, and I, I mean, this isn't a, a quote, I 
I made it cryptic. But it's, you know, some Windows variants, OS X, BSD, et cetera. But it, it really, they just say that's what it's made for, like, uh, it might work. And <laughs> I think that's kind of unfair, because of course we all, I mean, all of us are sitting these MacBooks. Uh, they have a second bullet called Efforts Made For, and they include other Linux, et cetera, et cetera, other products compatible. Um, so this is where Ruby code is for. And I can kind of keep this in my mind. So, we're going to answer this question. Well, where is it easy to compile C extensions? Dev Freaking Simple is on Linux, and I mean any Linux, I'm not going to qualify that with Debian or 32-bit, just any Linux, it's easy to compile C extensions. Also OS, OS X, once you get Xcode, which unfortunately now is not free with the new Xcode 4, but it's only 5 bucks, I think. Um, I imagine that simple, but I have not compiled on these, are FreeBSD, Solaris 10, oh, yeah, that doesn't work at this resolution. It says Symbian OS and it says AIX 5 Plus, uh, which are some of the lists from the supported list on Ruby 192. Also, pretty simple is Windows with an asterisk. <laughs> and we'll get to the asterisk. So, the answer is anywhere Ruby plus a decent C compiler can be found is where C extensions are portable. So, I think this is a really good answer. It's basically anywhere Ruby can be found. That's MRI. So now what's the asterisk for on Windows? I kind of want to go over this side note because the first time when I came to this conference last year, I brought my um, Lenovo and I had Windows. I was like one in two people with a uh, Windows machine. And there were a lot of people that they refused to believe that Ruby was available for Windows. They thought I was some sort of gag. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you no. Um, Luis Lavena uh, has been hard at work on the Ruby installer. So, okay, so Windows requires a few more steps to compile a C extension. But in my, uh, in my little opinion, it's uh, a little easier than Xcode. Because Xcode the first time was um, a, little, a little weird um, when I first tried it. So on, Ru on Windows, it's pretty easy. You just Google Ruby installer, and you'll find all these tools on one website. So there's the Ruby installer, which will install. Um, he has available 186, 187, 192 Ruby versions for you. Or you can use PIC. You can think RPM for Windows. It's not as fully featured, but it basically you can manage different Ruby versions. It includes JRuby, etc. Um, you can ins and then you need to install DevKit, which is this same environment for building C extensions. It's based on it's just kind of cobbled together MinGW and Nemesis. So they couple these environments together so that you can um, you can compile C extensions very easily. And then if you're managing a C extension gem. I highly recommend Rate Compiler. It's this phenomenal tool that will help you cross compile for different platforms and run tests on different versions of Ruby um, for, your, for your C extension gem. Those are all available on the one website. Okay, so the next question is are C extensions portable across interpreters or VMs? So let's look at all the big known uh, alternative VMs. We're going to look at Rubinius, JRuby, MacRuby, not IronRuby. I'm not sure if that project just fell off the earth, but. That kind of makes me sad. And Macro. So, looking at Rubinius, um, these are the requirements. It's a little weird, but it's basically like a subset of these are the requirements to compile a C extension, so we're good there. And so Rubinius works in a lot of different places. Uh, in 1.0, they wrote that they support popular C extensions. This is awesome. They kind of jumped on the bandwagon and decided to, to put a lot of work into this and support C extension. So they tested with popular ones, SQL 3, MySQL, No Fury. That one. And in 1.01, they um, they fixed a lot. There were like 18 bug fixes in, uh, in C API. So now they support Gherkin, Curve, RGB Builder. And in 1.20, there were five more bug fixes in C API. JRuby, they just released 1.60. That's awesome. This was like Tuesday. Um, so they provide binaries for all these operating systems, which is again where it's easy to compile C extension. So in one in they, they kind of added support incrementally in their release candidates. In RC1, they shipped extension support for OS X. In RC2, they added Linux and 32 Windows. In RC3, they wrote more platforms are supported. Um, and looking through the, the bug fixes, it looks like this is basically OpenBSD. Very cool. MacRuby has had C extension support for, I think, the longest. Um, in, in fact, in last April 2010, with their 06 release, they provided C extension support. They tested against Nokia Gary, SQL 3, and Postgres. And in 07, they fixed a lot of C extension support. That was um, this past October. Magla is kind of the last one on the train, but they're working really hard. All of their recent 
tweets are about C extensions. They write that it's still an alpha, but as soon as they get the C extensions, the beta is coming. Uh, somebody, PB McLean, took, um, tweeted about test results against Noki Geary. There was only four failures and four errors. Um, and then they've been doing some of these supports with C extension, et cetera, et cetera. So, WTF does that all amount to? It amounts to the punchline. C extension portable is the same as Ruby portable. This is very exciting. This is kind of one of the biz biggest excuses against using C extensions was portability. And I claim that with all the work that the different um, alternative VM writers have been putting into, that, that, these, that they all support C extensions and C extensions are not portable everywhere. Uh, so this is the state of C extensions. They're not a bright, this you know, weird dying breed amongst Ruby libraries that are alive and well. And they're highly portable. And when used pad crook pragmatically, <coughs> they're incredibly useful. And I completely support the pragmatic use of C extensions. That's it. For a convention, like whatever the conventionalized way is, if there is one packing C extensions, because I can't see. Oh, um, do people even agree on this? Because I, everybody seems to do it. Slightly. No, you know, I don't. I don't think there is. Okay, so the question was, is there a good convention kind of standard for packaging a C extension as a gem? Um, yeah. Not really. There are some in the in the gems API, in the Ruby gems API, which kind of a hard to Google document, but they have you list extensions and it will compile them for you. Um, also when you're installing a Ruby gem, if it fails to compile because it doesn't know where a library is, there's they're, they're actually very good you can kind of supply the um, the xconf.rb arguments uh, in your in your install to, to install a gem. The best place to ask that question is in the Ruby Gems IRC channel. Okay, so a good place to ask that is the Ruby Gems IRC channel. What I did is I followed popular gems. So Nova Geary has a very standard layout for their for their gems and then um, for their different gem specs. That's what I use. Yeah. Okay, I knew that was coming. This talk was for the Avid Reader. Uh, there was zero mention of FFI. And that's because I don't use FFI a lot. Um, I think that FFI is a good project and I want them to really pick up more speed. I think that that's their biggest problem, is that they haven't picked up as much speed as everybody wants them to. Um, but I, I do support, I know that there are places where, in terms of performance, a raw C extension does perform better than using FFI. So I think that there's some judgment calls to be made there. But yes, look at FFI if you think that a C extension sounds too hairy. And that's a oh, well,